Great. So yeah, the stage is oh, yours. Great. Thanks, Janice. Okay, so nice to be here, uh, remote. I just told my kids that I'm giving a talk in Boston. And they were like, that's the Irish city, and I'm Irish. But I'm actually calling in from Sweden, the land of no masks. All right, I'm going to talk about provenance for machine learning pipelines. And uh, I, all credit goes to my two PhD students, Alex and, and Mahmoud, both of whom will finish very soon, I hope. Um, but what I'm going to talk a bit about is... Um, uh, uh the, the bigger picture of ai as well and, and we're doing things a little bit different in, in how we we uh, address the problem of um provenance i'll describe what provenance is in a second but um the bigger picture of ai many of you will have seen this diagram before it basically says that training of models is only a tiny part of ai you have a lot more problems to do with managing your data um, and also managing the training of models and the, the pipelines and the serving of models and monitoring. So what, um, the, when we talk about end-to-end -end machine learning pipelines, really there's growing consensus that there's two parts that you need to end-to-end -end machine learning pipelines. You need something called a feature store, which I'll talk a little bit about because I guess many people are not familiar with what a feature store is. And then you need a machine learning platform to compute your features, train models and serve models. So let's talk about provenance to begin with. So what is a machine learning pipeline? Well, what a machine learning pipeline is, is basically going from some raw data, and that data you may, you may be image data, it may be text data for natural language processing, but in kind of the, the, where we work, it's often with tabular data, enterprise data, which is found in, in data warehouses, data lakes, databases, uh, event uh, message queues, and so on. But you'd like to get that data turn it into what we call features. Features are, are effectively the signals you're extracting from this data that will be used to train models. And then with these features, you train your models. And when you get a model, you can use that model to make predictions. So you'll get some live traffic that'll come in and live traffic will use the model to make a prediction. And that's basically what machine learning is all about, making predictions. So what provenance is basically is, is, is being able to go from one end, from your model that's being served over here, back to finding out what the data was that was used to train that model. And who did it? How did they do it? When did they do it? Issues very much at the heart of enterprise computing that we work on, um, but also very useful for things like reproducibility, being able to reproduce a model, um, and also debugging models. So uh, there are a bunch of uh, other reasons, not just uh, debugging and uh, reproducibility, but you track provenance also for governance, which is the classic enterprise uh, reason that you want to know, okay, is the data that you're training this model on okay? Are you allowed to? Is there personally identifiable information there? Um, also, we, 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 we track provenance to be able to automate pipelines. If we know that this particular phase down here, this stage of the, of the pipeline failed for some reason, well, then we need to go back and say, well, maybe we'll need to rerun earlier stages or the later stages can't be run because this stage crashed and so on. So provenance is relatively important, <coughs> particularly for, um, for having reliable AI and, and trustworthy AI. Um, and the pipelines are a little bit more complex than what I showed on the previous slide. So this one is just showing one that I often show to, to customers. Basically enterprises have their data in data lakes, warehouses, Kafka, and then you need to do some feature engineering to, to extract the signal from that enterprise data and you push it into the feature store. Now the feature store actually consists of two parts. One is serving uh, individual feature vectors to the online applications to make predictions on models. I'll try and explain what I mean by that. So if, for example, I, I'll give you an example of anti-money laundering. So I have a transaction. The transaction, this is my anti-money laundering application over here. And somebody wants to send money from one individual to another. So what I do is, I, is we, we take in the IDs of the customers, the IDs of the banks, the amount of money, the timestamp. But when we train the model, we had 250 features that we trained the model on. Things like how many transactions did the user perform in the last hour, the last day, the last week, um, the know your customer day, the credit score of the customers. All of that information is over here in the online feature store. We have pipelines continually feeding it with data. Every time you execute a transaction, we're, we're going to update that in the online feature store. It's a, it's a low latency database that will give you your feature vector. This is the, 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 the set of features that you send to the model to make a prediction. Um, the application will send the IDs of the customers, the banks, and so on, and give
get this feature vector. And then the feature vector gets sent to the model to make a prediction. So that's what the online feature store is about. However, if you want to train models with features, you shouldn't have uh, one way of computing features for the online feature store and one way for the offline. We have this single feature engineering pipeline. And this uh, feature engineering pipeline will spit out the features to both the online and offline often, so that when you're training models, you can go to the offline feature store, select the features you want, create the training and test data that you want to use to train your models. And then when you've trained your models and valid validated them, you can store them in something called a model repository where they can be used to, to basically make predictions, either by batch applications or by online applications. Again, just stop me, uh, shout at me if anything is unclear. I know there's quite a lot to take in, um, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about the feature store before we get started on, on uh, problems a bit more. There are feature stores everywhere. Every large uh, hyperscale AI company has one. Uber, Airbnb, Facebook, Netflix, you name them, they have one. Um, we built the world's first and currently only open source, fully open source feature store for machine learning. And what the feature store does is it, it, it will take our data that exists in the enterprise and the data in the enterprise exists up here. And you need these feature pipelines to compute the features from the existing data. And when it's stored there, we saw already that it's served to online applications in real time. It's also used for training models. And then it's also used by these batch applications. It's the same thing again. So features are not a, a um, uh, uh, they're not, not a kind of homogenous thing. Every feature is different and every feature needs to get updated at different frequencies. So for example, when you click on a, on a web app, um, those clicks will tend to get updated very frequently in our feature store. Whereas if you update your user profile, that probably only needs to get synchronized every hour or every day, not that often. And maybe web logs only get up uploaded and featureized every, every day or even every week or month. So many features will arrive at different rates. Some of them that are real time mightn't even go into the feature store because it'll take too long time to push in and pull out. Um, but basically the, on, the feature store needs low latency access for these online applications, but also um, it needs to be able to store large volumes of data to create training test data sets. So we worked with a customer, Swedbank, four, four zero, 40 terabytes of uh, features we use to train the anti-money laundering example that I talked about. There's a Spark Summit talk about it if you're curious, you can Google it. So there's the, the issue here is that it's actually, it's um, feature stores uh, need to be two databases currently. There's no existing database that we are aware of that gives you sub 10 millisecond latencies for doing um, uh, lookups of large volumes of features and also gives you uh, efficient storage of large volumes of data. So typically, so we use a, a, a database called Hive as the offline feature store, and then we use MySQL cluster or NDB as the online feature store. This is very low latency, and this one uh, scales to store large volumes of data. So uh, the complexity here is that it becomes very difficult to program this now. If you're gonna push your features to both the online and offline feature store, you have to do a bit of work. So what we do is we introduce an abstraction called a data frame API. And then when you do your feature engineering in Python with pandas or in Spark or uh, Spark streaming, um, you can push your data frames directly to the feature store. And then uh, whether a feature is in the online or offline is kind of hidden from you. It's, it's transparent to you because you're just pushing it to something called a feature group. And then the feature group will either be in the offline, online, or in both. And you just need to configure it when you create it. Okay, so, the, so our feature store is built on um, three concepts. Features themselves, uh, the groups that the features belong to because features are computed together in groups. This is our data frame or our, 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 a table effectively in the back end. And uh, you know, these will get updated at different rates and from different uh, sources of data. And then once uh, the, the, the features and feature groups are in place in, in your feature store, a data scientist can come along and say, hey, I'd like to join a bunch of features together to create some training test data to train a model with. So they might join, for example, these features from the Titanic with another feature, the bank account balance of people who are on the Titanic, because maybe we can better predict now whether someone survives on the Titanic or not. There's an extra signal there. If they had a lot of money, they might have bribed to get on a lifeboat, for example. 
Um, and then once you've got this trained test data set, you can train a model directly, you know, Pandas or, or, uh, or, or Spark data frame, or you can just save it to disk as a, in a file format that's used in machine learning. So we typically use in, in TensorFlow, we use TF Record, or in NumPy, we use for, for PyTorch or CSV for scikit-learn. Okay. And everything's version. So here's a little bit of code for it. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but those of you who like it, you read up a data frame, you do your feature engineering, you create this feature group and you say it's in the online uh, as well as the offline and um, you specify the primary key for them and then you save the data frame in that feature group which is just a met metadata object and that's it now ba now basically your data is available in the feature store and a data scientist can come along and say well i'd like to join a bunch of features together i'd like to to join from this rain feature group with the temperature feature group with the location feature group um, I, you know, I don't want to use the query planner, and, which is going to try and find a, a common join key between the feature groups. I'm going to explicitly specify the join keys, and then I'm going to create training data sets out of these, this data frame that I get back feature join. Um, and the training data set will be in TF records, and I'll split the data into 70% train, 20% test, and 10% validation. And I'm going to save this to, for example, my file system. And then later on, you can just read up the data like that. So I want to read up the train data set, I get it back as a data frame, or if I get it back as TF record data, depending what you want. So I, this is not a machine learning course, so I don't expect that everyone uh, uh, can, can um, uh, you know, understand exactly what's going on there. But if you do, then you'll get a, a reasonable feel for the value that it adds. So the reason why I want to talk about the feature store was basically because machine learning pipelines are no longer this monolithic end-to-end -end thing. Um, machine learning pipelines start uh, at, our, at our data source here and they end at the feature store. So we have this airflow pipeline, uh, which is gonna feed the feature store with features. Then when you want to train models, you basically start at the feature store until you've uh, trained and validated the models and deployed them into uh, some model serving infrastructure. And then you have monitoring of models. So let's, have a look at, at a bit more details of, of what an end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline is. So this, this one is, 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 I'll be honest, pretty heavily inspired by what we do uh, on the Hopsworks platform. So Hopsworks is an open source um, uh, data science and feature store platform for both developing AI applications or models, uh, but also operating them, so running them. So all of what we can see here, you can do on open source uh, Hopsworks, you can install today and play around with it. You can read your data, run feature engineering in Spark or Pandas or even Flink and uh, store data in the feature store. You can um, uh, train models and there is support for experimentation similar to MLflow, if you're familiar with that. Um, once you've trained models, we have a, a model registry and then we can deploy models uh, to Kubernetes to, to make them available to applications. So when the models are deployed and running, we also have support for monitoring those models and logging the predictions that have been made. Now, when we talk about provenance in end-to-end -end machine learning, what we really mean is, well, if something happens down here, right? So maybe somebody shouts out bias in your model, right? Um, and it's saying the, the model that's there, it's, it's, you know, there was a story last year of how Apple's uh, new insurance policy was biased against women. So um, females. So the um, the issue was ultimately that that Apple had bought some data from uh, the 80s, 1980s, I think, or 90s, when there was a larger disparity in income between um, males and females, and that caused the model to be trained to predict that women would be less credit worthy. So the problem is, how do you get from this bias here to figuring out this thing back here? You need to basically be able to find out what model was deployed, how it was trained. What was the program used to train it? The conda environment used. Um, you know, what were the hyperparameters? What features were used? Where did those features come from? This is what provenance is basically about, and this is the debugging aspect of parts. Being able to go seamlessly between all these stages and, and um, being able to uh, track what has happened. Now, what we do that's slightly different in 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 our platform, Hopsworks, is that we collect metadata at all stages in something called implicit provenance. I'm going to discuss that in, in some detail later on. Um, and we, we, we kind of tightly couple it with a distributed file system. I'll get into a bit more detail of what that means. But typically, the, the, the basic thing to take out of it is that we have tightly coupled metadata with our file system 
Uh, whereas in other systems, metadata is typically a separate store. And um, I'm going to go into some excruciating detail on what we, why we did that. Uh, but first, let's talk a bit about what is metadata. Metadata is basically data that describes other data. It's as simple as that, right? So if you have a file and you say, who's the owner of the file? Uh, who, what application created the file? Um, in machine learning, we have assets like models. And models are typically files or a bunch of files. They might be a serialized Python um, object, a pickled Python object, or they might be a protocol buffer object if it's TensorFlow with some weights in a, in a, in a, in a files in a folder. But you often want to know with that model, you say, well, who trained it? How was it trained? What were the hyperparameters used? Where's the program that was used to train it? What was the conda environment? What was the input data? Uh, that's metadata all related to that particular model. It's data describing it. So when you have a metadata store uh, for storing all this metadata about machine learning pipelines, and then the, the actual artifacts are down here in, in some kind of file system like S3 or our file system, HopsFS, you often want to ask queries of that data. You might, then the queries could be issued in many different ways. You might have a, a SQL query, like so select the top um, uh, most popular features in the feature store. So that might be efficiently executed as a SQL query. Maybe you want to find out what models uh, include personally identifiable information, and that's best issued as a free text search. Maybe you want to find out, well, what training data sets were used by this model, and maybe that's efficiently done through a graph. So there's many different types of queries and many different types of, of stores that can be used to efficiently store that data. Uh, but you also have systems issues related to how frequently will the metadata be updated? It's the update throughput, you know, my metadata store, will it be able to handle that? What type of queries will I be able to make on the metadata? You know, will they be really slow or do they need to be fast? What's the capacity of the metadata? You know, am I restricted to, let's say, whatever a single machine can store or can I have a distributed uh, metadata layer? So when you're designing this, you need to think about it. This is not a small space. This is a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, there are multi-billion dollar companies. Calibra are, are a big one. Uh, coming out of, they came out of Europe, a Belgium, multi-billion dollar company. Um, uh, Trifactor out of the Bay Area. Um, I guess you're in Boston. There has to be a data company in Boston. Abinitsu, I think, is in Boston. Um, but the, um, there are a lot of platforms in the space to manage metadata. For, the, for these data platforms, not specifically just machine learning, but data in general. And these systems that are out there today, they all follow one of these three patterns, right? So what they do is either you have, you have your data, which could be in the file system, it could be in a database, a data warehouse, a messaging bus, the basic raw data. And to get that metadata from, from those existing systems, you either have some sort of crawler which periodically pulls the changes in these platforms. So if it's a database, you might have a table. And the table has a, a column which says when the, when the column was last changed. So this puller is able to say, give me all the rows since I last looked, uh, 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 since I last pulled data from here and give me only the ones that have changed based on, that, on the timestamp from that column. And then you push it to the REST API to your metadata platform. You can also use something called a change data capture API. So some databases or um, you know, uh, platforms are able to tell you, here are the things that have changed in the last second or two seconds, or just spit them out as events as the platform uh, uh, makes changes to things. And the last way, and, and other a popular way to, to capture metadata is just to take your applications and instrument them. So make explicit calls to the metadata service to say, store this metadata. And we'll look at a, an example called MLflow and how they do that later. But basically, your it's going to be distributed. So you, you have your, your one system, your other systems running at the bottom, and then the metadata store collecting data. And the metadata data store doesn't need to be a single database, right? So, so very uh, you know, um, powerful platforms will have more than one metadata database. They might have a meta store, which is based in SQL, or a graph database, and or a graph database, and potentially Elasticsearch um, for free text search. So that when you're querying it, you can query it in the most, most efficient way um, uh, where that data is stored. But obviously there's some systems problems related to how do we ensure that the data uh, ends up you know, in consistent across, if, it's, if you're splitting it across multiple stores. And this is one of the research challenges. This is a really hard problem. You know, if we have this, um, you know, this job that's gonna be pulling and pushing data, Effectively, you're, what you're doing is you're implementing an eventually consistent replication protocol yourself. It's a non-trivial thing to do. Um, and there are many edge cases to consider to ensure that that data is correct and, and that you don't have 
uh, incorrect data ending up in the meta metadata store. So uh, what, we, what I'll talk about now is how we kind of challenge one of the assumptions here um, that that metadata store is always a separate service, right? That's a separate standalone service. Metadata is data that describes other data, but why do they have to be stored in separate stores? So in machine learning pipelines, this is the classic kind of metadata that you'll get, right? You'll have your artifacts down here, the raw data, the features that are used to train the models, the experiments that, that, that were used to train the models, that includes the programs themselves, the conda environments that were used, the logs that they generated, the checkpoints of the models, the models themselves, all these are files, right? Everything down here is a file. But the metadata about them, for example, who had the privileges to run this program? Can we get an audit of, of you know, who trained this model? Can we find out about the data retention of features for individual features? What do they look like? What's the mean or max or standard deviation uh, or, or distribution of a given feature value? Um, for individual experiments, what were the hyperparameters when this was run? What type of py Python environment was used? What were the results? You know, do you have any graphs? Um, and also when the models are deployed, what's the performance of the model? Was it good? Was it bad? Um, what kind of tests were done on it? What, who has privileges to access it? Where did the model come from? You know, what program was used to train and what features were used to train? So all of these features, sorry, all of these metadata, um, uh, all of this metadata that we see at the top and the artifacts that we see at the bottom, which are ultimately files currently in machine learning. And what we basically did on our platform is we said, let's make it one system. Screw that, right? Let's, because our file system down here, HopsFS, this is what we did originally. And I'll talk about it in a little bit. Our file system used a meta store, I mean, a, a scale out a database, a new SQL database called NDB or MySQL cluster. And the metadata for all of these artifacts, we could use by just adding tables to our database that extend the metadata of these files. So if I have a file related to features, which would be a data file in Hive, um, I can basically extend it. I can say, well, here's the features, here's the stati descriptive statistics for this particular table. Um, here are the hyperparameters for this particular experiment that was run. And here's the program that was used to run it. And here are, are um, uh, you know, a copy of the program and so on. So that's basically what we did. We have a new mechanism we call it mechanism four, where artifacts and metadata are in the same system. We have a unified metadata layer. And what this basically means is also is because our database has, it's a, a transactional database. So whenever I make updates to some of these artifacts, whenever I, for example, write a feature, I can also within the same transaction, when I update the metadata for the feature, I can update the actual feature statistics so that we get ACID uh, updates to both the metadata and the actual artifact itself. And I'll get to that in a little bit. So what we're doing here, this mechanism for that I talk about where we're embedding the metadata into the file system, and we're building it on top of that, we call this implicit provenance. What it basically means is you start with a data platform and your metadata is strongly consistent with this data platform. So this metadata store and data platform these are basically one system. So this, in, in our case, it's one platform altogether. Um, and what this needs is you need to redesign your data platform. That's kind of the hard part, yeah. Um, what we'll talk about, other things are, you know, we're able to um, exploit some information about conventions. So if your files, your model files are stored in a folder called models, um, or if your features are stored in, a, in a, 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 a directory called features, well, then it becomes easier to, to, to realize what you're talking about when you, when you do operations on those. Um, artifacts. So the other way, the classic way to do provenance is to do what we call top-down or explicit provenance. You make changes in your application. It can make calls on libraries to, to say, well, this is what's happened, or you can um, potentially uh, instrument the libraries so that the users don't have to know that you're, you're saving all this information. But ultimately, you're, you're just saving, pushing data to the meta store. Uh, we saw the three different mechanisms. You can have the push-pull, you can do the change data capture, or you can instrument your application or library code to push data to the, uh, to the metadata store. And typically, the metadata store will be a standalone entity. Um, and like we saw, it, it may it doesn't need to be one database; it could be more than one. But that, then that becomes quite complex. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this tight coupling between metadata and um, and files and how we've done it. Um, and this is a visualization of it. It's a system called ePipe. Effectively, when we have a file or an artifact in our file system called HopsFS, we have metadata associated with it in a scale-out metadata layer, but then we have the, the metadata of the artifact in the same database. 
and we use transactions to update it to make sure that they're consistent. And we use things like foreign keys to ensure the integrity of the metadata that if you remove the file, well then this extended metadata is automatically removed. That's what foreign keys do. They give you things like on delete cascade. So um, what I'll also talk a little bit about is that once we have this metadata layer, it becomes much easier to then um, replicate that metadata to an external system like Elasticsearch for efficient querying um, because, we, we, because we don't have to do the full implementation of the eventual consistency protocol we would need to between these two layers. Um, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Okay. Jim, so, um, sorry, sorry for interrupting. Yeah, go for it. Uh, quick question. So you don't you don't issue queries to the database. You extract the data and you use Elasticsearch. Um, well, I'll get to it in a second. But yeah, when mm -hmm. you're doing in our platform, when you do uh, provenance search, it, it does hit Elasticsearch. We don't hit this scale out metadata layer. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons for it I'll get to is that that this is an operational database. So um, I'll show you an example in a second. But if you're to overload it, you'll overload your file system, which is dangerous. Okay. So this is our file system. It's a next generation version of HDFS. Um, HDFS is a distributed file system, the Hadoop distributed file system. You have one server called a metadata server that stores information about the files. And it tells you basically, hey, if I want to write a file on which of these, these are called data nodes, which, where should the blocks for the file be stored? So the metadata server stores the path to the files and tells and it knows where the blocks are stored on these servers and it scales to thousands of servers, okay? So here we can see we're writing a cat file. There's three blocks, they're stored on three of these servers, DN1, DN3, and DN5. And as we write more and more blocks, they get spread out over all of the, the nodes. And then we can see that that's kind of how it works. So um, we, we basically redeveloped HDFS. It's called HopsFS, this is our file system. And what, what we do basically is we have a, a three layers now. We have the same name node layer in the middle here, but we now have the metadata, instead of stored inside this name node, uh, we separated it out. And this is now scale out layer. This can be scaled up or down. And this is our database. It's called NDB or MySQL cluster. It's open source database. Um, it's in memory by default. So um, if we now also, you know, we're now storing the metadata in tables because that's what NDB is. So if I store a file like the, the, the root uh, folder of my file system, it has an ID, an inode ID, it has a parent and it gets create. And then when we create our images directory, it's going to create another inode ID in a, in a table in, the, in our metadata layer. And when we write the file, it'll write the file as another inode. As we know, inodes are both directories and files. Um, and we can see that then that the, the blocks for that file will get stored uh, in the data nodes the same as before. So the advantage of what we did with HopsFS is that it just went much faster, right? We, we could store way more metadata, make much larger clusters, much higher throughput, because we, we removed a, there was single writer concurrency semantics, there still is for HDFS, whereas we have multiple write, concurrent writers supported in different uh, subtrees in the file system. Because remember, a file system is a, is a tree. And you can write in, in one sub part of the subtree and in some other folders somewhere else in the file system, you can write concurrently. That's no problem in HopsFS. Um, now, um, what we did in HopsFS, this is the Yanis's uh, question here, or, or John's question. Uh, imagine you have a file, which is this cat, and we, we tag it, we extend it with metadata saying, hey, I got a cat in this photo and I got a guitar. So our, 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 you know, the, our system allows us to have an extended table which says metadata for, for photos looks like this. We have tags of, of things that are in it. Now, you, it is a database, it has a SQL API. So I can go ahead and say, I, I wanna find all the images with one cat and one guitar. It'll kind of work. The problem is, is that it's a SQL API, right? And as soon as a bunch of uh, uh, you know, concurrent clients start querying it, they're doing what we call scans, either index scans or full table scans. And that databases do not like scans. They don't scale very well. The problem is, is that the database, like all um, relational databases, doesn't support full text search, right? So if I type cat in slightly wrong, it won't find it, um, you know, and um, same for guitar. So what you would like to do is you'd like to take this metadata that we have in, in our database, because remember, it's, it's in our database now. It's easier to get out at that data in the database, uh, NDB, and extract it and, and, and copy it or replicate it to some external platform than it would be if it was in, um, data structures in, in a Java program like it is in, in classical HDFS. 
So what we want to do is we want to replicate this metadata to some external store, in this case, Elasticsearch for free text search, but you can replicate it in principle to any store to do anything you want to. So how do you do this? So this is what this platform ePipe that we developed, uh, it was published at CC Grid last year. Um, it's a data bus. It, it provides replicated metadata for our file system. Um, it creates a consistent, correctly ordered chain stream for the file system metadata. And it delivers that stream with low latency, uh, so near real time to consumers. So the things that we, that, that we did in ePipe that were kind of interesting um, is that we basically, whenever you make a change to something in the file system, we'd have a separate table, a logging table to log the changes. So we would make the, that we'd make the updates to that log in the same transaction in which we actually updated the metadata for the file or directory. Um, and the database uh, that we're using for this metadata called NDB, it has a, 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 an event API. It, you're able to basically subscribe and say, give me the CDC, the change data capture, the live stream of changes to, to specific tables. So in this case, we can say, give me the changes to the logging table. And, I'm gonna, and, and when, they, when they arrive, I'll consume them. And then I can enrich these events that arrive. So I can say a file was created, a file was deleted. Um, and I can add as much metadata to that as I want to. And then I can publish that to downstream consumers. So um, one of the problems I allude to here is that, well, we want the logging table and the actual inodes, the, the files and directories to be updated in the same transaction to ensure consistency. We need, uh, again, we need foreign keys to ensure the integrity that if, if files are removed or, or um, if, if directories are removed, that, that, that the, uh, the logging table uh, is consistent with that, that, that um, it doesn't exist or it doesn't. So we can see here as files get added, we get in the logging table, we say, well, file one was created, file two was created. Um, and if we delete a file, then this one gets removed from here and the logging table still uh, has a reference to, to, the, to that file being deleted. Um, and then what we do basically is that ePipe will basically look for these changes in, 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 these, uh, in the logging table. So as the changes um, get pushed to the database, we get the change stream at ePipe and then it can go back to the database to find this extended metadata. So things like, oh, there's cats in this file or there's, there's guitar in this file. And then now it has more information about the file than just the owner and the name of the file. It says, well, there's cats and there's dogs in the file. So we can write it to, for example, Elasticsearch, and then you can search for cats or um, you know, dogs and you'll find this file because the file name is there as well. So there are some problems. This was a non-trivial thing to do. One of the problems was that if you um, create files, you, and you do many operations on the same file. So you create a file, you append the file. Um, the database um, doesn't just give us the change immediately when it happens. What it does is the database has something called an epoch. And an epoch by default might be a half a second. And what happens is all of those transactions get executed within that epoch concurrently. There's no ordering on them in the database. So if, for example, we have a create uh, of file one and append on file one in the same epoch, but we get some other operations on the file. We get F2 and a delete on F1 in, in another epoch, epoch two. Well, the good thing here is that we know actually that, that um, there is order across epochs. So we know that, for example, delete F1 happened in an epoch after the create and append on F1 in epoch one. So we know there's an ordering between those two. And that's great. And by default, it's not 500 milliseconds, it's 100 milliseconds. Um, so we can make that statement based on the database. And, and we can make the statement also that, 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 that F2 was deleted after it was created because it happened in different epochs. However, within an epoch, we don't know any ordering. So we have an operation such as create a file or append a file. We don't know which one happened first. Um, we don't know the relationship between creating F2 and, and deleting F1. These happen in the same epoch as well. And that can lead to problems, right? Because you know you might you might uh, uh, say to your metadata store outside of it, you know that this file, the trivial one would be that the file you 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 deleted a file before you created it. Now obviously you, you have application knowledge to know that a file can't be deleted before it creates, and that's something you can exploit. But we wanted to have a more general purpose solution to the problem than that. So the database tells us that epochs uh, transactions in different epochs are ordered, totally ordered, um, but within the same transaction there's no ordering. And the changes on files, however, are ordered only if they happen in different epochs and no ordering is guaranteed within the same epochs. That's not enough. We need to strengthen these ordering properties. And that's what we did. We introduced a logical clock, this is the name of our company, a version number for each inode. Every time we make a modification or mutation to an inode, we'll increment this 
version number. And th this logical timestamp basically enables us to, to, to now know the ordering of the file system operations that happen within the same epoch. Um, a very simple solution um, and a very classical solution in distributed systems. So a, a virtual clock to, to, an, a, to give you some ordering guarantees that are not available in the base database system. So now we know, for example, that F1 was appended after it was created because create has, has um, logical clock one and uh, append F1 has this logical clock two, different version numbers. We, um, so if we have create F2 and delete F1, well, we can't say anything because these two are, we can see that, that, that um, they, they, although they have different version numbers, they don't relate to the same file. So we don't know uh, really which one happened before the other one. So the version number ensures the serializability of changes to the same file or directory within epochs. Um, and the order of changes for different files within the same epoch doesn't really matter in general, is the general point there. We'll see that we can get more information outside of it, but in general, we, that's not, not a, uh, a, a huge problem. So uh, the platform has not very much overhead. I'm gonna skip over these performance numbers. They're not massively relevant. Um, but basically adding this um, uh, logging and um, synchronizing it to, to our file system meant, uh, sorry, to synchronizing uh, the, the changes to Elasticsearch added not particularly much overhead. Um, and compared to other platforms like notifying of changes in files in HDFS, well, we were like, I don't know, um, 10 to 50 times higher throughput. Uh, and the latency then was orders of magnitude lower. So we'd ran 100 millisecond, less than 100 millisecond latency between the changes and then them being updated in Elasticsearch. So a couple more points about ePipe before I go on. That you know we do this. It does support things like failure recovery because the the, the logging table is is part of the database, which is persisted across you know um, uh, cluster failures, and the log entries are deleted once you saw the events being pushed downstream. So we we clean up, of course, the logs, and then we get a, a, at least once delivery semantics is what we can guarantee. Um, it's a pluggable architecture. We're doing it for a lot of things. We we can filter out events based on file name and any other attribute. It's not just limited to our file system. We can extend it to, to watch for logs for other things like Hive. So we're using the same metadata layer for Hive, which is what we're doing here as well. And what we'll see in particular is that this filtering events, that's what we're using in machine learning provenance that we'll get to in a little bit. So that's ePipe and that's what we're using to basically ensure that we, can, we have the same metadata in the same uh, system as, as our file system and we can extend that metadata and then we can get the changes to that metadata and replicate it um, eventually to, to things like downstream consumers like Elasticsearch. And it's very efficient. Uh, it has low overhead on the file system and it, and it, 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 it pushes the, the changes at very low latency to uh, Elasticsearch and it can handle very high throughput. So um, that's basically how we've been doing um, uh, uh, this addressing the problem of getting metadata out of the file system and making it um, available in in what we call different stores. So we have it in our in our NDB SQL database, but now we have it also in Elastic. So how do we use this in the machine learning pipeline? Well, the first thing to note here is that um, we have files at the bottom down here, and we have the metadata up here. And some of the, the, the files like models and features, they're actually gonna have well-known names. So we're gonna know that the features in a directory called the feature store directory, and the models are gonna be in a model directory. So that's kind of an interesting starting point. Um, but before, before we look at that, if you've seen provenance for machine learning pipelines, you might've heard of something called, called MLflow. It's used to, to train models and also to serve models. And um, they do the very explicit provenance that, that I was talking about before. So I'm just gonna show you the code as what, what, what that means when you're writing MLflow code. So if you're familiar with TensorFlow, you know, when you, when you write TensorFlow code, you, you, you want to get your data. So we've got some data up here on this line here. Uh, we've got training and test data, and we've got our, um, we've got our um, in this case, these are our labels. So Y is the labels, and then we have our, our training data here. And then we want to fit a model to the, to the training data. And what you can see in here is there's a lot of text in black related to MLflow. So when you want to, to, to you know, store information about what's happening in this training experiment, uh, you have to connect to an external database. You have to um, make a lot of explicit calls to this tracking server uh, 
This is basically what we call top-down or explicit provenance. You, you have to do the work yourself. So in our platform, um, pretty much the same thing looks like this. So firstly, in our platform, you, you just put your code inside a training function, and then we invoke that training function from our own library. Um, it gives you, dis, it dis, so this training function can actually be distributed in the cluster. But despite, apart from that, you can see that we don't have all the calls that the explicit calls that were made in the ML flow program. For example, when we say save a model, well, the model will get saved in a directory in our file system. And what we'll do is we'll basically see with ePipe that, hey, a model file was stored in the models directory. And then we can basically push that event to um, Elasticsearch and we can index and, and create all the index about saying, well, this model exists and it was created by this person uh, uh, and so on. So we don't have to explicitly write it in our code because our file system will capture a lot of these events. Also, when you read the training data in, we'll capture that event as well. And again, write it to the metadata store. So um, provenance, as we said before, is, is also about being able to, to navigate from one stage to another to another. And through each of these stages, we were going to be outputting this metadata. So for example, the raw engineering data, uh, the, the raw data was coupled with these feature engineering features, and we store that to the metadata store. And um, and how we, we've talked about already, what we're doing is we're, 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 we have all these hooks in our file system that whenever there's events on, in terms of files being updated, that ePipe will catch them and then we'll push them to Elasticsearch to be able to search for them. So the platform is managing um, much of the metadata. So some of the challenges that you have here are that, um, well, firstly, the artifacts that you have are things like features, feature metadata, training test data sets, models, model metadata, um, if you're training large models in TensorFlow, you may have potentially thousands of files. You have th if it's images, you might have thousands of images. Um, you might have thousands of operations per second. Our, our file system can handle over 1 million file system operations per second. And we have uh, ePipe is really just one server. And ePipe can handle about 100,000 ops per second, but um, you know, can't handle a million. So what you need to do is you need to only capture the relevant information because even when you're training models with TensorFlow, a lot of temporary files will be created. There's gonna be a lot of um, uh, writing out of checkpoints and things like that, that you may not necessarily want to always capture. So what we want to do is capture only relevant information, but we also wanna capture as much information as we can because the file system maybe doesn't have enough on its own. So you might say, for example, let's have a look at, at, at we have some operations being executed here. Can we get more context in our file system operations is the question. We know that, that, that for a file system, John is the owner of this file and Alex is the owner of these files, the blue ones. So John owns the green ones and, and Alex owns the blue ones. Um, do we know anything about the relationship between these files? Are they, are they related in any way, shape or form? Well, what we do in Hopsworks is that when we run applications, they actually run in our cluster manager, it's called Yarn. And each application has something called an application ID and there's a certificate associated with it. And you probably, if you're a cool kid, you've probably heard that Yarn is crap and Kubernetes is the best. Uh, well, Kubernetes has no application IDs. So we cannot do provenance on Kubernetes currently because there's no support for application IDs. And uh, that makes it uh, impossible to do what we're doing here, which is saying that, well, John updated these files as part of application one. And Alex updated these files as part of application two, and John updated the last file as part of application three. So now that we have this extra context information, and this context information is available in HopsFS when we run applications, because when a client connects to HopsFS, it connects with its app ID certificate, and then we know the name of the application, we know the name of the user, and we know the name, um, sorry, we also know more information about um, uh, time uh, when, when it's happening and so on. So, so that, that gives us a lot of additional context information because when we have the application, we can now use application IDs to say, well, if this application wrote these files, what files did it read? And that enables us to build this graph. So without the, the application ID, we couldn't build the graph, the provenance graph, being able to say, this file was written, this model was written by this training program, which read these features. So if we didn't have the application ID, we wouldn't have been able to do that. And then we wouldn't be able to find out 
the uh, jobs, the feature engineering jobs that created the features in the first place. So the, uh, apart from the application ID, uh, user IDs, which you typically find in file systems, what was your file system operation? What was the file? Uh, we've also added a couple of other um, pieces of additional context information. Um, if your application is run as a job on our platform Hopsworks, we add the job ID in there. And if it's run as part of an Airflow pipeline, we'll add the pipeline ID as well. So you, you basically have an Airflow job, uh, Airflow launching a job in our cluster, which launches a Yarn application, which is the program that's this thing here. And all that context information becomes available so that we can basically say, hey, this was the pipeline, for example, that um, trained this model, which is a file in the end. Okay, so just a so, little bit left. Yeah. Uh, quick question. So uh, provenance information is uh, at, at the level of, of the file, right? Well, the starting point is the file, but you can layer anything you want to on top of it. So, you know, the kind of information that we, we would have is, well, you get some of the examples here. We would know the application associated with the file, that what was the last application? What was the operation performed? Was it delete a file, read a file, write a file, append a file? Um, we know the user who did that. We know the job that caused that application to run, and we know the pipeline that caused that job to run. Um, and then you can have any metadata associated with the files as well, because files might be, for example, features in the feature store, and then we'll have a lot of feature metadata. The file might be a model file, so we're going to have a lot of model metadata as well. So what's the most fine-grained, let's say, a provenance information that you can you can have? Can you, can you also have metadata for, uh, let's say, lines uh, in files or uh, individual updates in features in the feature store? Is this possible? So we have support for just attaching generic JSON objects to files. So, I mean, uh -huh. honestly, it's, it's pretty straight. It, you, you, you do it at the application level. So I can attach a, a JSON object which says, this is the metadata for lines 0 to 199, right? Okay. And I can attach another metadata object that says, this is the metadata for lines 200 to 2000. Mm -hmm. Then it's up to the client who wants to, to parse that file to say, okay, read the tags or these JSON objects to say, okay, well, this is the metadata for the first 200 lines, this is the metadata for the next 800 lines. Okay. I mean, the, the insight here, I guess, is that when, when you get into the world of kind of big data, everything ultimately, even, even your databases, your, your, your data warehouses, everything is stored as a file. And, the, and models and all machine learning artifacts pretty much are, are files. So th this is what the, the machine learning artifacts that you have, the features in the feature store. Ultimately, these are data files in Hive. Um, training data sets are the TF record, CSV, or NumPy files that you use to directly train your models. We have the models themselves, protocol buffer files, or um, you know, pickled Python uh, objects. The logs that you generate uh, when, you're, when you're training these models and doing feature engineering, and notebooks that you use to train the models. Because we have these conventions in our platform, what that means we're able to do is, that all the events that are generated on our file system, we don't need to we don't need to parse all of them. We can basically say, based on the path, if I'm writing to any of these folders, like the models, train data sets, or feature store, I'll let the operations go through. But other operations, file system operations on temporary folders, or maybe on, on other data not related to machine learning, I'm not gonna store those um, events at all. And this saves us a huge amount of traffic. We can also filter based on tags. So we can actually add an attribute or a tag to any of these files or directories. These are called X attributes in, in HopsFS or HDFS. So you can basically tag a, a particular directory and say, this is a tutorial. And if there's no tag like that, then you can just basically say, ignore the tag. Okay. Then other things you can do is you can co coalesce file system operations. Um, for example, we may have lots of reading of files inside a train data set, and um, uh, we just need to store one operation. So for example, if you're reading Parquet files or if you're reading TF record files, um, you, you read a directory, but there may be thousands of files in there. You don't need to store a thousand operations. You just need to say, hey, I just read this Parquet file or this um, uh, Tensor record one. And this is basically the same point um, with a little bit more detail. We do, you know, what we have is we have caching as well, with the name nodes to say, well, this was already read and we have a, a log table and so on. So the kind of filtering we can do, we can filter on, you know, file system operations, creating, deleting artifacts, uh, 
on the X attributes, the tags, um, how we read them, what were the child files or not, whether files are appended or truncated and permissions as well. So, um, yeah, this is kind of where, this is kind of the, uh, I, I won't go into too much details, but you can see that the end to end our platform, it doesn't just do all of this implicit provenance. Implicit provenance is mostly CDC from ePipe. Um, but you can do, there are explicit API calls like we saw earlier when we're training a model that we'll call maggie.logom um, uh, and it'll experiment that logom, which will say train this file. So we have some API calls because you can't get away with them, but we vastly reduce the number of explicit API calls you need to make. Um, now I mentioned this example already, but like you know, the, the value of provenance is being able to answer questions like, hey, bias was detected, what do I do now? How do I get all the way back to the beginning? How do I find where this came from? So um, if we take the example of, of, of one thing that we do in our feature store is we, we also support asset updates to the feature store. So every time you update a, a group of features, a feature group will store commit ID associated with that update. So you, are you able to actually go back in time and say, well, I noticed there was bias and, and where did the data come from? Well, you could say, well, maybe the data was this data that was ingested on the 10th of the first 2020, right? Or maybe it was the data ingested the day before that or the data after. So you can go from your, model that's being served all the way back to the training data, which features that were used in that train data set and which raw data was originally ingested and that maybe caused that problem. We're building on a framework called Hoodie. There are other ones like Databricks Delta or Delta IO. And then there's, um, there's an iceberg one by uh, Netflix as well. So that's it, right? I've kind of come to the end. I've been talking for quite a bit. Provenance is this problem of, uh, is, provenance is gonna be a big word I expect next year, right? Because Right now, what's happening is that, that people are, are, are different organizations and companies are, are really specializing in different parts of the machine learning pipeline. Um, but pulling it all together is a hard bit. And that's what provenance is about. It's pulling together um, the different stages in our ML pipelines to help you improve your understanding of it. Um, when you add provenance to machine learning applications, ideally you don't, shouldn't have to rewrite your code, which is kind of what MLflow is doing, to be honest. Um, and TensorFlow Extended is the same by Google, TFX does that. Provenance will help you debug your applications, analyze them, automate them, clean up your pipelines, clean up artifacts that are no longer needed. Um, when you've got time travel added in there, you can make uh, your experiments reproducible. And we, uh, a part of the HopSearch platform, we've developed this new implicit provenance mechanism where we embed the metadata with the file system and we extend it all out of that in this scale out consistent metadata layer. Here's a bunch of references there. Um, very uh, Hopsworth centric. And um, please, please, please like us, star us on GitHub or follow us on Twitter if you think it's cool. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I'll take questions if we have any.